Well, good morning, everyone, or, okay, it's morning for me, afternoon for probably most everyone else here. Um, I do wish I was in Oslo, actually. Uh, I'm in, uh, I'm out of Texas in the USA, um, and it's very warm here, um, and it's much nicer in Oslo, I'm sure. I think yesterday here, the high hit something like 37 C, so I would have much rather been in Oslo enjoying the beautiful weather there. But uh, we do the best we can with what we have, so um, I hope everyone enjoys this. Uh, so my name is Jimmy Bogard. You can find me on Twitter at, at jbogard, and you can find this presentation and all the code behind it uh, on my GitHub at github.com slash jbogard. There's a presentations repository there that you'll find as everything that you see here. Um, I blog about this topic and a lot of others on my blog at jimmybogard.com, and I am an independent consultant. I'm also a technical fellow at Headspring, which is a software consultancy out of Austin, Texas. And uh, let's see, I've got an MVP award. Um, and I do a lot of open source stuff uh, with Automap or Mediator. So um, I've been doing domain driven design in one form or the other since about 2003 or 2004. Um, and I've been uh, over that time, I found myself uh, having different ways of applying the different concepts inside of domain driven design. Initially, when I got started, uh, with domain domain driven design, I thought that everything that you needed to do was a lot of upfront design. And once you get the upfront design and the whiteboarding and stuff, then the models should just come out of that. So you have the conversations with the business, you talk it over with your team, you build this nice, lovely model, and then the code is supposed to be just fantastic. Uh, but what I often find is that that wasn't the result I would see. Is that even though my model looked great, the code still didn't look that great. So let's talk a little bit about what domain driven design is before we can talk about how we refactor ourselves into a good domain driven model. Um, so domain driven design, in my words, and by the way, unfortunately, the domain driven design book doesn't just like have a bolded definition for what domain driven design is. Uh, the, for me, I try to think of it as it's an architectural design strategy in which we selectively distill, organize and abstract the body of knowledge from the real world and users in the real world to our software. And so the goal of domain driven design is not to represent exactly the real world, but to provide a sort of um, a distillation of the real world into software users can actually use. And I like to think of it very similar to uh, physics, where you have like very low level quantum mechanic physics that are really complicated math. But as you start to get higher up, you have simpler equations and simpler problems that kind of encapsulate and abstract the details away. If you get really small, uh, the really like subatomic level, then those equations go out the door. But as we move up in the size, we can start to think of things in a different abstraction layer. And domain driven design is a lot like that, in which we're taking the real world, which is very messy and kind of hard to deal with, and saying we need to distill that down to something that users can actually use. We're not trying to represent everything in the real world, but a piece of it, a part of it, so that uh, we're not building software that, that represents like everything that could possibly happen in the world. So part of what you do with domain driven design is you try to build a model that, re that represents that design. And this is known as a domain model. And a domain model uh, actually predates the domain driven design book. And uh, do a domain model, I find the best definition actually from a book on my shelf there, um, the patterns of enterprise application architecture. And it defines a domain model is an object model of the domain that incorporates both behavior and data. So we take that domain, uh, the domain knowledge, we distill it into some kind of object model, and we ensure that the object model that we build represents both the data and the behavior of that domain. And that's the real key here, that we need to have both data and behavior. We don't just have data, because that would just be a database, and we don't have just behavior, because those would just be functions. It's the two together that really define a uh, cohesive uh, domain model. And these domain models move beyond just kind of the nouns and verbs that we do from a kind of simplistic object modeling. We look at the relationships between the things, we look at uh, how that information changes over time, and all those kind of uh, considerations pulled together give us our domain model. So that's great, we have this kind of like ivory tower, uh, you know, perfect view of the world of our domain model. But when we look at our code, after we do this domain modeling, it sucks. Like the code is still really difficult to read. Uh, sure, we have this, this nice object model that represents our data, but the actual, like the actual functionality of our system, we find that that still doesn't look great. 
And so the, the building blocks of domain driven design don't really solve this for you. Um, it's not like we could just take all the different kinds of things in domain modeling. Uh, we have entities, aggregates, services, and that'll just kind of magically produce a well-defined cohesive domain model. So how do we get there? And for this, I turn uh, to a slightly older technique, uh, test urban design, that tells us in order to build a, a well-factored, well-understandable system, we can follow these three basic steps. We write a failing test, we write a passing test, and that last critical step is to refactor. But most of the systems that I inherit, most of the kind of legacy systems or, or systems that have a well-established body of functionality, don't necessarily have the first two items. They've got like, well, we've got some tests uh, and some of the tests pass, but some of the tests fail, but don't worry, we've commented those out, so you don't have to worry about those anymore. And so for these kinds of existing systems where you have a lot of existing behavior that we want to refactor into a well a thought out, well-designed domain model, we have to get really good at that third step, which is refactoring. Now, luckily, we don't have to come up with all the different refactoring techniques on our own, that these are well-established names, well-established practices that we can leverage as part of our journey from taking a very simplified view of the world into a very rich domain model. So if we're looking at what can we build on top of, what techniques can we choose from, there's three really great books that define and describe different ways of refactoring code into cleaner code at the end. Uh, the, my favorite though is the Working Effectively with Legacy Code book from Michael Feathers. Uh, it's a very long book that this basically just how to add tests to existing code. And that's the <laughs> that's how you can work effectively with legacy code. Um, and the other two great books that I find are Martin Fallow's refactoring book, which has been updated to a second edition uh, that describes uh, kind of techniques in the small of how to refactor code. And then the techniques in the large uh, are the are described in the refactoring to patterns book. And the refactoring uh, the original refactoring book was really about looking at individual classes and methods. And the refactoring to patterns is trying to take that one step back and say, well, we have all these design patterns and they're not just a, you know, they're not just a recipe or a checklist. We say, oh, you got all these different patterns in our codes so or must code must be clean and good. Instead it says, let's look at code smells exhibited inside of our code base and use those code smells to guide us toward perhaps different patterns, design patterns that we can apply to help make our code cleaner. So I want to look at an existing system um, that exhibits all the right things in terms of the names of things. So all the names of things look good from the business perspective, but the behavior is hard to understand and sorely lacking any kind of design. So the current state of this system is, uh, this is a system for a loyalty reward system. So in these kinds of loyalty reward systems, uh, you have people that buy things from stores. And uh, if you want to get uh, more value out of your purchases, then you can join a rewards program. And those reward programs reward you for loyalty for going to that store. So the idea is that the more you purchase from that, uh, from that store, then you get points or something. And then eventually you get, uh, you get rewards for, um, basically for, I guess, for giving up your personal information and purchase history, <laughs> you, get the, you get the rewards on the other side. So our domain model looks like this. Um, I said three kinds of things. We have members, we have rewards, uh, our, our business owner doesn't like to call them rewards, he calls them offers. And then we have different types of offers in our system. We've got um, kind of some metadata around what kind of offers we can give to our different customers. And so in our domain model, we represent these concepts as domain objects. So we have entities and aggregates that represent these top level concepts of members of offers and offer types. We also represent the relationships between those as different um, navigational properties on each of our domain objects. So in this picture, for example, I have a member object and a member has a set of assigned offers. And that's represented as a collection property on that object that I can go to a member object and I can go look at then the list of their assigned offers. We also have the reverse. If I'm looking at an individual offer, then I can look to see who was the member assigned to that one specific offer. And finally, offers are associated with some kind of metadata information about that offer. And that's that offer type uh, class we see at the bottom there. So every single offer has a type associated to it. And that type um, helps describe the behavior of the offer uh, as it's getting uh, used throughout the application. So I can take this picture and show it to the business 
and there'd be nothing here that they would disagree with. Yes, we have members, and this is the information about our members. Oh yeah, we have offers, and this is the information about offers. And yes, this is they can even understand their relationships. Yes, a member will have many assigned offers. Uh, an offer will have a, a, a type associated with it. Um, maybe this is done in this kind of diagram, in a class diagram. Uh, sometimes I've seen it, of course, done in kind of an entity relationship diagram or like a class uh, tables in a database. Uh, but I should be able to take the kind of informational model and share that with a customer in some kind of abstract form, and they should be able to understand what it means and also agree with all the different names associated with all the different properties, types, and associations here. So I could show this to the business and there would be nothing they disagree with. But you look at this and ask, does this actually represent a domain model? We go back to the definition. The definition of domain model is that incorporates both data and behavior. But looking at this model, where's the behavior? Well, this domain model doesn't live by itself. It's probably as part of some application that's running or some system. And so the behavior does exist somewhere. It's just not encapsulated as part of the domain. So if I wanna find out where the behavior actually exists in the system, I look for those helper classes. And those have a lot of different names um, I've seen over the years. So uh, the, the names of those classes typically don't have anything that describes the function that they are. So you have things like service or handler or manager or controller or page, like all those things describe kind of the what it's doing, but not the behavior behind the scenes. So that, that behavior does exist somewhere in our application, but it's not encapsulated inside our domain model. So what I wanna do from here is take an example of one of these services and refactor its code until it's encapsulated inside the domain model. The reason why I wanna approach it this direction, because this picture is super easy to do with a business. I say super easy, it's relatively easy to do with a business. Um, we can whiteboard this, we can, we can uh, raise things and move things around and come to a pretty good understanding of what the domain model's information shape needs to look like. The behavioral shape though is much harder to whiteboard. The behavioral shape, you almost have to start with code and refactor into the shape it needs to be. We can make educated guesses sometimes about where the behavior needs to be, but those are just guesses. In terms of where the behavior needs to go and uh, what it needs to look like, I want the code to tell me where it needs to go. And the way it's gonna tell me where it needs to go is through the code smells it exhibits and the way I know where, it's, uh, where, where it ends up, that that's the right place, is that after refactoring, the design is cleaner and more understandable. So I wanna take something that is inside of that services folder, and I wanna refactor it towards my domain model. So instead of just refactoring kind of in a bubble, for me, the behavioral domain model uh, is really formed by refactoring the behavior towards the domain model so that the domain model truly becomes a rich behavioral and data structure. So I'm gonna switch over now to Visual Studio. Okay, so I have here, uh, in this case, I'm actually using a library that I wrote uh, called Mediator. And uh, Mediator is basically uh, just a library to help encapsulate requests and responses in the system. And I kind of think of this as like mini domain services from the Domain Driven Design book. Um, and that they represent exactly one function uh, or one operation that you perform. Um, so I'm really big on vertical slice architecture, um, the idea that I, I put everything related to a feature next to each other. And so this represents all the functionality and behavior required to assign an offer to a member. Now this class by itself, um, this was my first go around at writing this. And when I first write any of these kind of handlers or services, I wanna make it as dumb and procedural as possible. And the final step in that red, green refactor step, um, if you don't have tests, test, then I guess it's just refactor, is that final step to be able to say, now we need to refactor it. Now that's the part I usually leave out in my, in my talks about vertical slice architecture. I just say, just make it as dumb as procedural as possible and then just refactor at the end and everything's great. Um, but not many people know how that looks like or what, what, what it means to actually refactor something. Uh, so that's what I wanted to walk through here. So this class completely encapsulates the work to assign an offer to a member. I have one single input, which is this offer request object, and that carries a two pieces of data required to perform that operation. I need to know the 
the ID of the member that you want to assign to. And I need to know what kind of offer, what type of offer I want to assign to that member. So those, these three pieces of information, the data, the member ID, the offer type ID, and the operation you want to perform, assigning an offer, those three pieces together are able to encapsulate the work necessary to assign an offer to a member. So let's look at this fun class. Um, and it's not short, it's kind of long. Not terribly sorry to be long, because uh, I, I didn't have hours to refactor this. We only have about 45 minutes. Uh, but I wanted to represent the kinds of different things that typically see happening in a given handler for one of the uh, kind of normal projects that I work on. So let's walk through these individual steps one by one. Uh, well, the first step we have to do in this class is, well, we have to load some information. So in this case, I'm just using Entity Framework. So this is just a DB context. Uh, in that DB context, we're going to find the member by ID. We're going to find the offer type by ID. Now, the work required to assign an offer to a member is not as simple as just inserting a row into a database. So I'm doing some more complex logic behind the scenes. So that's why I'm actually pulling back these objects as opposed to just like an insert statement in the database. So it's more complicated than just SQL can handle. So that's why we have it in C Sharp. Okay, got the member, got the offer. Um, the first thing we need to do is understand, well, what is the value of the offer that we want to give to the client? Well, for this, the client decided that uh, code wasn't good enough. So we wanted to have a rules engine to be able to do this work. And this rules engine is behind an API. And so this first set of calls here is about calling some API, be able to calculate the offer for a given member based on the, their email address and the offer type. So all the work behind the scenes are like, oh, this, this member is like a, a super duper member that has a lot of history. So we're gonna give them a good offer. Where this other member is maybe not so uh, not such a frequent shopper, so we're going to give them a lower value, uh, lower value offer. So the the logic to figure out what we should offer that uh, what what the offer value should be is in behind this API call. So that's step one. Step two, we need to calculate the expiration date. Now for this system, we have two kinds of uh, expiration types based on my uh, based on my offer type. So if I go to my offer type object. We've got the name, the number of days that it could be valid. We have an expiration type. An expiration type represents two ways of doing expirations. One is an assignment-based expiration, saying that this offer is valid until this specific uh, uh, fit, uh, date. Um, when that offer is assigned, or it's on a fixed date. So you could say, like, we have a, I don't know, a New Year's, uh, a New Year's Day offer, and that offer is good for the next week. And so that offer is good from January 1st to January 7th. Sometimes we have uh, offers based on when they are assigned, and so that's the first one there. So uh, whenever I sign the offer, it's good for the next seven days, the next 14 days, the next 30 days, whenever that is. But it's more of a sliding expiration. So whenever I sign the offer, that's when that offer uh, is expiring. So that's what this switch, state, uh, switch statement is. It is calculating the logic for uh, when that offer should expire with a switch statement. So now that I have the value of the offer and I've got when it expires, now I can do the final piece of work of assigning the offer to the member. So down here, we are going to instantiate a new offer, passing it all the properties that it needs. We're going to add that offer to the assigned offers collection on the member object. And the next thing we do is going to increment the number of active offers for that user. So this is something that's a calculated property on this object that I need to keep track of to understand like when the user logs into the, to the system, they just see a big, you know, a big number at the top that says, here's the number of offers you have. So instead of me having to make all those calculations behind the scenes, having to fetch additional data, I'm just gonna pre-calculate that information and store it on the member object themselves. And the final piece I need to do is to save those objects. So I'm going to add the offer to the offers DB sets and entity framework and then finally save it. So I load the objects, perform some calculations, uh, make the appropriate associations, and then finally save the objects. If I look at most of the work in my system, it's basically this. I load some data, I do a bunch of work, and then I save the data. And so the, the loading and the saving part is the most boring aspect of the system. The interesting part is the stuff in the middle. And you can actually tell here because it got so complicated that we actually started to comment our code about what this logic was doing. 
So we can separate out logically, like this is the part where we're calculating the offer the value. This is the part where we're calculating the expiration date. And this is the part where we're actually assigning the offer to that member. So if I'm looking at this code, and this obviously is, too, is complex enough that we're adding code comments, then the very next thing I'm going to do is say, how can we, how can we make this code cleaner? So the first step that I would look at for this kind of code is applying and refactoring. And the first refactoring I look at applying for something like this, where I have a long method, is a, a refactoring node is compose method. And compose, mes, compose method refactoring involves uh, taking every single block of logically defined set of operations and extracting individual methods for each of those sets of operations at the same conceptual level. So I can, I can determine what those conceptual operations are by the code comments. Like if I have code comments that separates out these individual steps, instead of me having comments describing the code, I bet we have self-describing code, and then I will extract methods for each of these operations. So I'm going to first extract a method here. Now I'm using ReSharper, and I'll show you why in a second, why I want to do that. So I'm going to say, extract a method for this block of code. And the name of the method, I'm just going to make calculate offer value the same text to the comment. Like if it was important enough to have the comment call that, then let's call the method the exact same thing. So, all right, so that block of code was extracted out. I can go down and look at it, see if everything looks okay. Yeah, everything looks okay. Uh, this doesn't look right. I don't know why I have a, a temporary variable here, so I can go ahead and inline that because I don't need that additional variable and everything looks okay here. Okay, now, um, what if I don't like this? Like, eh. I didn't look quite right. My code doesn't look better. Um, every refactoring that I have should have an equal and opposite refactoring to reverse back the operations that I just performed. So that is available to me in ReSharper. I can say inline method, which is the reverse of extract method. When I inline method, it should go back to where it was before. Everything's back exactly where it was. Huzzah. I like where it was before. Um, the reason why I want to show that is uh, it's very important for me that for me to, to have uh, confidence, have safety associated with these refactorings. It's not enough that I just have a one-way refactoring. I really need to have the reverse as well. So if I make a change to my code and I don't like what I see, I can reverse that change as well through an opposite refactoring. And I won't always have the undo uh, button available to me or the undo um, undo operation. I may have to have that logical undo in this case, which is inline that method. So let's go back. I like to where it was before. Yeah. Value equals await, calculate offer. Okay. So the next place we have is calculating the expiration date. Let's do the exact same thing we have there. So highlight the, the code we want to extract a method for, extract a method. In this case, we're going to call it calculate expiration date. And the final one is assigning the offer. So extracting this set of code by itself, assign offer, uh, and then the final piece is there's a these two things kind of go together of saving saving the thing. So let's extract a method for that as well. Save offer. Okay. So. Um, this may be, be where I stop on a lot of the refactorings I do. It says, okay, you know, we, uh, we had a long method. It was too long. We didn't extract just one method. What we want to do is extract individual methods for each set of operations that we have. So the next developer coming and looking at this, uh, let's just get rid of these comments. We don't need this, do we? Yep, yep, yep. Instead of having comments describe these sets of operations, we have methods that describe the operations. When I have those methods, it's very easy for me to tell exactly the information required to be able to perform those operations. So I can see calculate offer value requires the member and the offer type. Calculate expiration tape just requires the offer type. And assigning the offer requires the member, the offer type, the value, and the ex expiration date as well. So it's very for easy for me to see for each individual operation exactly the information necessary to perform those operations. Okay, uh, but that's not. That's not quite good enough because we're doing domain driven design and I want to refactor this code towards the domain model. And right now this, this code and logic is still just inside a single service handler class. So let's look at each of these methods one by one and figure out how we can refactor that code towards a domain model. 
And let's start at the top. I've got this method here uh, called calculate offer value. And this calculate offer value, actually let's change the order of the parameters real quick. I want the cancellation token. So I just got rid of that thing, but I guess you're supposed to use it all the time. Uh, let's move cancellation token last so it doesn't confuse me. And so we have the, the member and the offer type. And if I look at this code, it's not like it's dealing with any one of these objects by itself. So it's dealing with both member information and offer type information. So I don't think I can move that logic just to one of those objects. But if I wanted to uh, do any other kind of testing for this individual handler, it'd be a bit difficult because I have this dependency on an HTTP client. So what we can do is uh, move this method out somewhere else into a separate service so that that service is then encapsulated for, uh, or encapsulates all the logic needed to calculate the offer value for a member and a given uh, offer type. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is extract a class. So I've got my, my little caret on this one method. I'm gonna say refactor and extract a class. And this will tell me, uh, ask me first, what's the name of the class we're going to call it? So let's call it offer value calculator. And one of the things we're trying to do here is, is name it based on the, 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 uh, the responsibility and the role of this object. So things that don't really describe the role, like, like service manager or helper, those don't really describe the behavior associated with it. So I try to make the last part, like the, the, the name of this thing, uh, represent the verb that it's trying to perform. So it's a calculator, it calculates a, a, an object. Um, it needs to use some objects to do its work. So I'm gonna say, yep, you need to pull that thing over. And uh, that's now gonna be a, a, uh, a member on that target object. And this method is private. So we need to go ahead and make that public. Go ahead and click next. And now we have, oh, here we go. Uh, offer value calculator that accepts an HTTP client. And now it has this public method for calculate offer value. And then down here below, We've got the offer value calculator, um, but now it's, it's getting instantiated uh, directly inside of here. So I'm gonna change that a little bit. I'm going to, uh, actually let's do this first. Let's extract an interface here because the, the overall goal here is to have my service class not depend on a, uh, a concretion here, especially when I'm dealing with external dependencies of an HTTP client. So I'm going to extract an interface for this class called I offer value calculator. Okay, so this interface now represents uh, the operation to calculate an offer. I don't like that name, it's redundant. I have I offer value calculator with a method called calculate offer value. That seems redundant. So let's rename that to calculate. Okay, so now my usage, instead of calling out to a private method, I have extracted that method extracted the class from that method. And now I have an interface that represents that method as well. Now my class though, isn't using the interface. So I'm gonna refactor this to say, uh, use base type where possible. So instead of me using the concrete type, use the interface type. And now the class uses the I offer value calculator instead of the offer value calculator. And the final piece is to, I don't want to pass in an HTTP client to this class, I really just want to pass in the interface to the offer value calculator. So I can refactor this and say, introduce a parameter for the offer value calculator. It's going to be of type I offer value calculator. And the thing that can be removed now is the HTTP client. Click next. There are new uses of the constructor because everything's dependent to injection. Huzzah. The value of the new parameter will be lost. Click next. And oh, it didn't quite. Sign it, there we go. So uh, we now get a, a, this uh, service interface in for the offer value calculator. And then now the work to calculate the offer based on the member and offer type is encapsulated from this handler class. I don't care how or why that offer gets calculated, but the work done necessary to do that stuff is now in a separate class that performs that work. So let's move these classes uh, to separate files because it's getting annoying for me to look at that stuff. Okay, 
Now, if I look at this offer value calculator, there's not really anything else I would expect to pull out of this. Like it's now it's it's code just dealing with calculating that that member based on offer type. And in fact, I may even do things like, well, do I need the whole member object and just pass in the email and the name of the offer type? Eh, we'll leave that for a uh, future refactoring. I do need to make sure though, now that I've introduced this interface, um, I should go to my DI configuration and ensure that at transients, I offer value calculator, offer value calculator. Value calculator, there you go. So a little bit of wiring to get the dependency injection stuff up and going, assuming I have that in my application. Uh, but this ensures that my handler now no longer depends directly on this like external web service thing. And it says had that external web service thing encapsulated behind a service. And that service has this interface behind it. So my handler now doesn't have to worry about like the, the direct logic of calling this external web service anymore. That's now, that's now encapsulated. So I think, we're done with that first method. That first method is moved out into its own individual service. Uh, at this point, I'd run all my unit tests. Uh, wait, I don't have any, so I guess everything's green. And let's move on to the next one. Okay, so the next method we have in our list is calculating the expiration date. Okay, so we look at this. A few things I notice. First, there's no async, no wait. So it's not calling off into any kind of external things to do its work. And the object being passed in is just an offer type. So if I go to this, I receive an offer type and I return a date time and it's static. So that tells me that it doesn't use any state for this object. And the only information it uses is the information on this offer type object passed in. So what that tells me is that this method is very much concerned with some other method, uh, with some other object. And that code smell, it's a few names for this, um, is known as inappropriate intimacy. So I have code somewhere else, very, uh, that is concerned very much about someone, uh, another object over here. And so um, I should be able to look at this and say, this, this logic is 100% dealing with this other object. How about I move this logic to that other object? And so we can do that. So um, there's, a, uh, there, there's, a, there's a slow way and a fast way I can do this. I'll do it the slow way first. Uh, the first I would do is uh, I can move this. So I can say uh, move to another type. I'm going to move to model that offer type. Okay, like next. It's going to tell me, well, it was private before. So we're going to need to make it public now. Click next. Okay. And now that method is gone here. Now it's moved over to my offer type class. This isn't exactly what I wanted, though, because it's a static method dealing with this object. Uh, I'd really just want to have that method be an instance method. So there's another refactoring for that. Say, make method non-stack. What ReSharper is going to do is look at the parameters and say, okay, uh, instead of you passing in the object, if you want to make it an instance method, I will need to use the instance fields or properties on that parameter. So it's going to convert all of these parameter usages offer type dot blah into instance properties or instance usages. Click next, huzzah. Now it's an instance method. I don't pass in the offer type anymore. I just use the offer type object itself. And now over my handler, up here, uh, I say offer type dot calculate expiration date as opposed to calculate expiration date passing in the offer type. I'm gonna undo this because there's actually a quicker way. Undo, undo. Now my method is back on my handler object. Let's perform this refactoring again, except this time, I'm gonna go straight to make method non-static. And this will move it directly from this object to the other one, make it public, make it non-static, use all the instance properties all in one fell swoop. Gone from here, go over to my offer type, Huzzah, here's my offer type now with the correct calculated expiration dates. And now the method has been moved successfully from this object, which is just a dumb service object, over to the actual domain object that represents that behavior. Okay, now let's look inside that object 
Now that the behavior has been moved to the right place and look at the contents of it to see if there's anything we want to refactor here. Well, it's really just a switch statement, um, which isn't terrible by itself, but a lot of the times in the systems that I use that have an enumeration, we find switch statements littered across our application dealing with the different values in those enumerations. And so there's not one spot I could put that logic. So right here, this is, this is logic very specific to assignments of kinds of expiration types. This is logic very specific to fixed type of expiration types. Wouldn't it be nice if I can move that behavior over to the enum so that the behavior around different kinds of expirations was encapsulated in one location. However, we can't do that because enums are just like fancy numbers, fancy name numbers. Um, they don't really allow us to have any kind of behavior associated with them. We could put metadata on top of them so I can decorate these different enum values with attributes. So like kind of display information or things like that. But that's just additional data and metadata. It's not additional behavior. So if I have the case where I have a switch statement about an EMOM that uh, I see a lot of different places, all these different switch statements, what I would like to do is to move all those different logic for all those different cases into one individual spot so that I can see all the behavior related to assignment type expirations in one spot and all the behavior related to expiration type, ex uh, fixed type expirations in one spot as well. So we have a problem here though. Uh, C sharp today does not have any kind of fancy enumeration types. Um, there are proposals in C sharp 10 to have fancier enumeration types. And uh, if I was brave, I would have installed the Visual Studio preview, but I'm not quite that brave yet. So instead we can leverage some open source project projects to provide additional behavior around enum kind of types. And so I've already actually pulled this one in. Um, this package uh, is from Steve Smith and it's known as smart enum. And smart enum is basically a hybrid between classes and enumerations. So what would that look like? So over my expiration type, this is just a enum, okay? I'm gonna change this to be a class. So it's class expiration type. It's going to inherit from smart, smart enum and because of funny generics business, I have to say it's a smart enum of itself, which is weird looking, but whatever. Okay, and it needs a constructor. And the constructor uh, takes two things, the name, which is what you see, and the value, which is how it's gonna be persisted or stored behind the scenes. My application shouldn't really care about the number, but the database probably does. And the final thing to do is convert these two public enum types to public, uh, public properties or public fields on this type to represent those two fixed values. So I, can do that. I can say, uh, instead of assignment being one, I'll say uh, public static read-only expiration type assignment equals new expiration type. And the name is name of assignment and the value is one. Okay. Do the same thing for fixed. We have a fixed type, name of fixed, and the value is two. Okay. Um, the last, oops, ooh, too far. Uh, the last thing is uh, I don't want anyone to create these sort of things. So let's make this constructor private. Sure. Now we have a private constructor. Um, so I can only have these two specific kinds of things, but now I have a class instead of a method. So I have a place to put this information. So back over here, okay? Uh, we have this calculate expiration date, right? And it's dealing with this expiration type. Um, but what I can do is extract a method for this part that's dealing with expiration type. Extract method and calculate expiration date. And it'll probably give me, uh, yeah, those, those two names are the same. Um, so what I wanna do is move this method over to expiration type. Okay, now this is going to be expiration type dot calculate expiration date. And over my expiration type, I've got a public method. 
and I pass in the offer type and I get the information out of there. So pass in this. And instead of having all this temporary variable nonsense, let's just return that. So you notice that this is not quite as clean with uh, keyboard shortcuts as some of the other ones or the, the tooling. And that's okay. Um, sometimes these, these writing takes uh, multiple steps, multiple jumps. And so I try to be very careful about those. Um, and once I complete them, go ahead and uh, go ahead and run all the tests, commit to ensure everything got moved over correctly. So the calling code doesn't care about this though. It just knows to call the expiration date over my handler. But what I've done is moved all the logic for the different expiration type calculations over here. It doesn't work though, right? Because we have a switch around the expiration type. And so this is incorrect. What we really want is uh, assignment kinds to have this and fixed kinds to have that. So there's a, there's a few ways we can do this. So first thing um, we could do is just say, uh, switch to expiration type uh, dot value. And this value is going to be one and two, Blah. just temporary. We'll fix this in a second. Um, and this, so this, the next thing I wanna do is have, um, let's figure out what to do with the switch statement. So the switch statement um, is complex conditional logic. And so one of the ways I can uh, fix a code smell of complex conditionals is replacing, this is from the refactoring to patterns book, replacing a conditional expression with a strategy pattern. And so now that I have a class that represents this individual uh, set of behaviors, and I also have individual properties or fields representing the two kinds of expiration types, I now have a hook to be able to provide a strategy for each kind of expiration type in my system. What I'd like to do is move this logic of calculating the expiration date to an assignment expiration. And the other kind of expiration where I'm uh, going based off of the begin date over to the fixed expiration type. So let's do that. So first thing I want to do is um, I want to make this method virtual so that it can be overridden in drive classes. The next thing I'm going to do is create different derived classes for each of these expiration types. So I'll have a private class uh, assignment type, and that's going to inherit from the expiration type class. It needs a constructor, but the constructor, no, I don't need to pass it a name and a value. Actually, I'll just take what we had before and say, that is the values you're going to pass in. And you don't actually need a constructor because I know for assignment types, these are the values you should use, okay? So we'll do the same thing for fixed. Fixed type will have its own expiration type as well. Fixed type, fixed type, fixed, and value of two. Okay, so I've got assignment type, assign, Mint type, thank you, spell check. And fix type, those don't do anything yet other than encapsulate the name and the value. So over here, instead of me using the, uh, the base types of these, I'll just say new assignment type. And this is new fix type. Okay, so uh, the behavior is exactly the same though. So uh, I have derived types over here, but the virtual method um, is still executed every single time. So what I wanna do, the last little piece is move the actual behavior for calculating expiration date over to as an overridden member to each of these different assignment types. So over here, I can say override calculate expiration date. And its behavior is going to be this the body of that switch statement. So this says datetime.days add blah, 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 blah. And we'll do the same thing. With the other one. And this one's a little bit more complicated. 
It's got like if else throw junk. So let's put that in there. Um, and so let's say return that based on the upper type. Uh, this looks like it can be simplified. There's some grayed out, uh, remove redundant else, uh, convert to a conditional operator. Uh, this says I can use a null coalescing expression and it's gonna use an expression bodied member. So that all gets distilled down to um, use the begin date, add days offer valid. If this expression returns null, then throw an exception because you need a begin date for that piece. So at this point, um, it's overridden. So each possible value of expiration types has overridden its specific strategy for how to calculate an expression date. At this point, I would run my tests, they existed, and val verify that all tests passed. And then finally, that I know that, that um, those different strategies are in place for everything. At this point, this method is no longer used. So I can actually convert this class to an abstract class and change this method from a virtual method that, that has a default behavior. Now it's going to be an abstract method with no behavior that has to be filled in by each individual, uh, each individual strategy. So what I've done here is I've converted an enum that had only data and no behavior to an enum class that includes both data and behavior because enums have fixed values and effectively those fixed values become strategy implementations for the behavior in my system. So as I encounter new, new fun and exciting switch statements in my system, what I'll do is I'll convert those to abstract methods on this class and the implementations will be the implementations of each strategy. So instead of trying to be, instead of me trying to make the switch statement better, I just got rid of it and replaced it with a strategy pattern. Okay, now I, I still have to make sure that this actually works with the rest of my system. And the typical hang up with this kind of approach is, well, I have a database. I need to make sure that this thing can actually be saved to the database because I can't, I can't just pretend like the database doesn't exist. I need to know how to convert this information into like save statements to the database or update statements or inserts. Um, and so what you can do here is really gonna depend on how your domain model gets saved. So some folks, um, they, they make their domain models separate from the persistence models. And so this persistence model of entity framework or Mongo or whatever it might be, it's loaded into your domain model where the behavior is. So now we kind of completely separate those two things. I find that entity framework and most ORMs are good enough that I don't have to separate those two things because that's a bit of work. And so I just combine the two together into a single model that represents both data and behavior. So I just need to make sure that my ORM can handle how to save this thing. So how can it handle that? Well, it turns out um, it can. And the way I do that is to configure uh, on model creating model builder that entity of offer type dot property of expiration type. And then I'm going to give it a conversion. I'm going to say that the conversion, I need to know how to save it and how to load it. Let's say the way that you save the thing is going to be that value. Okay, so that's how we save the objects into the database. That even though it's this object in memory, when I go to save it, it's just going to be the numerical value. And I could choose anything from there. I could have chosen the name as opposed to the value, but we're going to make things simple and make things a value. And the next piece is, okay, now that I have the value, how do I, how do I convert that to the, your object model that you have? And so for that, um, that's where that smart enum package helps me out. It's actually got a bunch of helper methods to be able to uh, load the right object based on its individual value. So I can go to expiration type. Is to, uh, value goes to expiration type dot from value, the value from the database. Okay, that was pretty easy. I save it as an integer. And when I load the integer back, I just use this enumeration class helpers method to find the correct uh, property or field or instance and use that, uh, use that instance. So behind the scenes, um, this will look at the different public static read-only fields and find the right one in case it's assignment and load that as the correct instance. So I'll go to, uh, in my object model, I actually use that assignment type 
in my object model. So going back to my handler, I've now encapsulated the expiration dates logic all the way down to the actual enumeration class and use a strategy pattern to be able to pick the right strategy for calculating, calculating the expiration date based on the expiration type that it is. Okay, so I've got the expiration type, got the, uh, the offer value. The last little piece is this assign offer method. So this assign offer method, uh, there's a lot of stuff. It's going to uh, create an offer object. And then the next piece is going to assign that offer to the user. Now this is the, this is the first kind of smell I see is that um, this property, number of active offers, needs to be consistent with this property over here. Unfortunately, there's no connection between those two things. I can do, uh, you know, member that sign offers that add range, add a whole bunch of them, that delete, remove, remove all, remove range, truncate, concat, like all sorts of things, because that value, that property on that field, is just a list. And lists have a lot of methods that are probably not supported by the business. So the first one to do is to make sure that those two things really get changed together is to fix this, this issue of, I can do anything with this list of assigned offers. So let's encapsulate these two things first. So I want these two things to happen together. So the first thing I'm gonna do is extract a method. Let's call it assign offer. This time, the assign offer method takes a member and an offer. The offer's already been created over here. And then I'm going to move that method by saying make method non-static. It'll ask me where I want to move it to. I want to move it to the member object. Then that's member.assign offer passing in that offer object. Now assign offer has the encapsulation of adding the offer to the assign offers list and bumping up the number of active offers. But I still haven't fixed this problem, which is that public list of T doing all the sort of junk. So this phase point, I have to look at what does the ORM support to be able to encapsulate this collection access? And it turns out EF Core offers a lot. So what EF Core can allow me to do is to use a backing field for this uh, actual collection and only expose what is necessary to expose. I'm gonna do a couple things. First I'm gonna do is I'm going to Two properties, there it is. Two properties backing field. Okay. So I've now got a private list of assigned offers. Um, and I don't actually ever want to have the setter. So I'm going to remove that setter uh, because in any framework, my ORM knows when it sees a property like this that has only a getter, it will look for a field that has camel case with an underscore, a bunch of other naming conventions. I can even give it a name if I want to as the thing it's actually going to uh, add those items to. So make that read only. And the final piece is I no longer want to use an enum or list of this. I don't want to expose a list directly. Instead, I'm going to say, this really needs to be an I enumerable of offer. And now down here, instead of me uh, manipulating the list of the property, I'm manipulating through this uh, this field, this backing field. Let's uh, also make this setter private so we don't allow anyone else to set this property except for our own individual object. So now with this in place, um, I don't let anyone do anything with my uh, offers. Instead, I only allow them to go through kind of the front door and say, I, you can look at the, 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 the list of offers, the, the collection of offers. That's a read-only enumerable, um, enumerable list. If you want to do some operation, you have a method on my object to be able to perform that. So now this collection is encapsulated. Um, the usage is encapsulated from the calling classes. Over here, it looks exactly the same. I go assign offer, blah, 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 blah. And away we go. Now, the last piece I want to do is um, I've got the logic separated for assigning offers um, separate from the actual domain object itself. 
So I've got like the, the offer value calculated over here and I've got the offer assigned over here. Um, what I really like to do is have the member itself really fully encapsulate all the work necessary to be able to assign an offer to a person. Um, but everything's kind of separated out. So let me first inline this method. And yeah. offer, offer. And I'm going to now extract an entire method for all the operations related to assigning that, that offer. So I'm going to extract a method for kind of the, all the business logic. Assign offer. And let's move our, our fun cancellation token all the way to the end. Okay, so I say assign offer. This does all the work to, to assign the offer. And then finally uh, returns that value back out. Now if I look at this method, and again, it's dealing mainly with the member object. So it's got like, it's some offer creation stuff, but it's calculating based on the member. Um, it's doing some stuff for offer type, but if I look at the logic, it's, it's, it's mainly a member. I see member, let's see, one, two, three places, offer type, uh, three places as well. Um, but it's, it's, it's an operation I'm doing on the member. So what I'd like to do is, is take this logic on assigning an offer and move that logic to the domain object itself. So let's try to do that and just see what happens. So I'm going to move this method. It's gonna ask me, where do you wanna move this to? I wanna move it to the member object. It will be encapsulated, access rights will be extended. So uh, it's gonna to try to deal with this. Sign off, there we go. The handler object. Um, I don't wanna pass on the handler object. I don't wanna pass in the value, the, the, uh, the field of property to that. Um, really what I wanna do is, is take those uh, things and make that a parameter. So I can highlight the, the value that I see there and say, extract parameter and safely remove the handler. I don't wanna pass in the entire handler, just give me the offer value calculator. And finally, let's move these. Turners around, so I pass in the offer type, then one to assign, the calculator, the cancellation token, and I'm good to go. And last piece, do I really need this assign offer method over here? Probably not, so let's inline that. Okay, so with this in place, I've got um, a completely encapsulated method for assigning an offer. It does take a dependency through the method argument, and then it uses that dependency to call back out to the calculator saying, I need you to calculate st your stuff based on me and the offer type being passed in. This pattern is known in the c -sharp world as double dispatch, where I'm passing in a service, and then I call that service with the right parameters for it to do its work. So back in my handler, I don't actually need this anymore. Uh, let's just remove that all together. And now this takes cancellation token. Okay, so uh, now looking at this picture, I got my save logic, my, my, excuse me, my load logic in one place in my handler or this domain service. Um, the next thing it does is delegate 100% off to the domain model to do the actual behavioral work. Once I get that object created and the business logic completed, I now call the save method. So it's load, do work, save. And the actual do work is now 100% encapsulated inside my domain model. Everything necessary to actually perform the business logic of assigning the offer to the user is now as part of this individual method. The nice thing about this is you can look at this domain model and now this domain model is actually unit testable because this domain model is 100% encapsulated. It's not calling out to other services. Any dependencies it has are passed in through these uh, abstractions. So in this case, the abstraction is this API service for, for calculating an offer. That's now just passed in as a, as, a, as a parameter to an individual method for that one individual operation. And in a unit test, 
I can then stub that out, uh, fake it out, provide a different, you know, a different value uh, based on different inputs. And now this, this domain model is now 100% unit testable. Over my domain service class, which is what this is, this handler, at this point, I'm done. I would almost certainly integration test this with an actual database, but I'm not trying to test all the logic behind the behavior. I'm really just wanting to make sure that kind of happy path testing, I can load the objects, I can perform the business logic and save them. Otherwise, um, this code is as good as it needs to be. I don't need to do anything else here. So what do we see here? We saw a lot of refactoring. I was using a lot of the tool set to be able to do so. Um, I was working in very small incremental steps, but one of the things I was doing was refactoring with a purpose. And that purpose is looking at the design smells associated with my usage of these different objects and aligning my refactoring towards the domain model. So instead of pushing out into stateless functions or other stateless classes, I was moving that behavior towards the domain model as was necessary so that my domain model is now a rich behavioral entity with all the operations available to it on that entity, and it's 100% encapsulated. So for future things I could do here, um, you see there's a lot of public getters and setters. I could probably fix that. Uh, things like um, there's no constructors associated to ensure that these objects are set up correctly. I would still likely go through and add those kinds of things, but for refactoring this one individual method, I think it's good enough. So that was domain-driven refactoring, where I am using domain-driven design to build that domain model, and I'm using refactoring techniques to build out that behavioral model that domain-driven design says we need. By using refactoring techniques and code smells, it ensures that the behavioral model that I create is based on the true behavior in the system and not something whiteboarded or just in our imagination. It's based on the actual code and the actual code cells we see in the application. So by using refactoring techniques and code smells, it ensures that our domain model is as cohesive and self-contained as it can be because we're using the real actual behavior of the system to do so. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be on ye old Slack um, afterwards. Otherwise, if you want to see more information about this, you can go to my GitHub uh, dot com slash presentations. This entire example will be up there a before and after view. You can also read more on the books I showed earlier, the refactoring book and the refactoring to patterns book. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you have a great rest of the conference. Thank you.